Good evening. Hello. My name is Joshua Shuping, and I wanted to uh, return again after quite a bit of a hiatus in uh, sharing uh, different thoughts about Eastern Orthodoxy, my experience as an Eastern Orthodox priest, and my attempt at trying to articulate um, reasons why I believe that Eastern Orthodoxy presents a false system and a false gospel. And so today I wanted to return to the subject of icons. I know I did discuss that subject in an earlier video, uh, but there were some important things I felt that I left out and I thought that it would be good to go ahead and attempt to uh, return to the subject and try to cover up some of those areas, uh, touch some of those bases uh, to, to kind of make it a little bit more clear um, what, what some of the real problems are uh, in the Eastern Orthodox theology of icons. Uh, it may seem like a little thing. Um, part of the reason why I'm saying this uh, is because when people come to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, when converts or people who are evangelical who may be attempting to discern whether the Eastern Orthodox Church is a place for them, um, I mean, in many ways, it's, you know, they'll, they're, they're going to find like maybe something like the Reformed Orthodox Bridge website or or they'll find like the nearest priest at a church and, you know, and it's like they're going to see, you know, the evangelical Christian, you know, on the 20 yard line and they're going to want to like bring the evangelical Christian like all the way to the 100 uh, yard line. And so they're going to kind of try to gently play by play, play by play, try to massage and ease the the evangelical Christian uh, into the false system. Uh, and it's usually um, by, uh, maybe it's well-intentioned. Uh, I wouldn't say that people are intentionally lying, but I, you know, it's also true that, that uh, deceived people deceive people um, with sometimes great intention. And so, I think it would be important to kind of look at some of these issues a little bit more deeply, especially related to iconology, to kind of show what's really at stake, um, what the Orthodox claim uh, really is. Um, you can find an Orthodox priest, you know, and they'll say, oh, well, I've ne I never make anybody uh, bow or kiss an icon. I would never make anyone venerate an icon, they might say. And that's probably what many of your friendly neighborhood Eastern Orthodox priests are going to say. Um, but that's not what the church itself says, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so that's kind of the problem. And that's where some of that deception starts to happen. Not to say that it's intentional, it's kind of gentle. And they might think that, oh, well, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's a hospital. And, you know, and so we know that these people are unguided and we need to kind of help them slowly essentially go through a process of searing their conscience or descent, maybe a better way to say would be to desensitize them to the gospel. So if you're an evangelical Christian and you have a, a real heart uh, for the gospel and the simplicity of the gospel and the truth and the power that's present uh, in the gospel message, um, you know, I, I hope that, you know, this message may cause you to, to pause and really think through some of these issues. So without further ado, I'd like to say that that the basic argument here um, is that iconodualism, iconoclasm, and aniconism are fundamentally distinct positions. Um, I'm going to be presenting not iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is the idea of destroying, removing, saying that imagery is in all ways uh, impossible shouldn't have it, shouldn't have an action Bible, shouldn't have a little coloring book of Noah. Um, I'm not making that argument here presently. Uh, I'm making the argument for aniconism. Iconodualism is the idea that the, uh, as the Seventh Ecumenical Council defines it, which is a key detail, as the Seventh Ecumenical Council defines it, which is to say how the Eastern Orthodox Church formally defines iconodualism, is that if you don't or you refuse to worship and ve or venerate, excuse me, icons, have strong affection for them, bow down in front of them, kiss them, uh, then you're accursed. And we'll we'll talk about that. We'll we'll look at those actual Seventh Ecumenical Council claims and statements. So that's the basic uh, part of the basic thesis or the basic argument here is uh, rooted in these distinctions between iconodualism uh, and iconism and iconoclasm. 
we'll be looking at the aniconic uh, pos uh, position. And so we'll be arguing from there that, that iconodualism, as defined by the Seventh Ecumenical Council, is uh, a profound innovation. Uh, we'll, we'll be going through three basic points. And the first will be a per that it's a profound innovation away from the early church consensus. Uh, and it violates the, the it's, I guess people call it the rule of St. Vincent of Lorenz, uh, who, who kind of gave a, a descriptive definition of what orthodoxy, lowercase o, orthodoxy would be. And that is what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council um, has absorbed a, a clear violation, or we'll show that it's a clear violation of that. We'll start with uh, looking at a book. Uh, it's published by New York University Press, um, uh, written by Moshe uh, Barash, uh, History of Icons. He does an, uh, a nice survey of uh, many of these uh, issues and subjects from a historical perspective. Uh, he doesn't have a particular axe to grind. Uh, he's just trying to, to do honest scholarship. So we'll just go ahead and get started right in here. <clears throat> um, looking at authors as... Uh, early as Porphyry, who is in the late third century, um, who's trying to defend, he says, the cult of images, is still saying in his early work about images, uh, which is preserved only in fragments, this is page 60 in this book, that it is only the uneducated who identify the gods with the images. In other words, this is the idea of the semiotic use of, uh, of imagery, that we're not that, that, that the Eastern Orthodox Christians will argue that they're not worshiping the, the image itself, they're not worshiping the wood, they're not worshiping the paint, they're, th there's like a referential process where their worship is really being, uh, or the veneration is really going to that which is represented there in the image. Uh, how that process works mystically, why God would count that, uh, bowing down in front, in front of an image, uh, 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 as honor of himself, you know, it would be a very mis mysterious process. But it was actually a pagan argument. It was very fully developed by Porphyry, late third century, where it's uh, where he would even go so far as as to to argue that the only that only the uneducated identify the gods with the images to say that that the, the image is the god so they already have developed this notion of uh, iconology that the later orthodox pick up so there's a straight line of development that the pagan uh, pagans argue for icons in such a way and the later christians uh, orthodox the, the byzantine christians in about the, the sixth seventh century they start picking up these arguments finally um, the early christians had been rejecting them universally uh, in the first generation. So we'll go to our, our next little spot in our book here. And I apologize if this isn't as efficient uh, as, it, as it perhaps could be. But we see here again on uh, page 81 where resemblance uh, is perhaps indicated, though not clearly articulated in still another way. As we have just seen, Porphyry compares a statue or a painting with a written text. So that relates to another argument that the um, Orthodox Christians use in favor of, of icons, is they say they're written texts. It's the, it's, it's the textbooks for the illiterate. They're for educational purposes only. So again, that's going to be just a, a common pagan argument. They're just picking up this pagan argument. Christians have been rejecting that arg that kind of argumentation, not picking it up, um, you know, deliberately having it was available to them. And so they they left that argument. And now later, these later Christians, we as we know, uh, pick these arguments up. He also says uh, in uh, relation to this kind of referential uh, semiotic argument for icons, um, this is uh, from Porphyry's Against the Christians. He formulates his views. He says, those rendering proper worship to the gods do not believe the god to be in the wood or stone or bronze from which the image is built. For the statues and the temples were built by the ancients as reminders so that those who went there might be at leisure and be pure hereafter and might come to think of the god or that they might approach it and offer prayers and supplications, etc., 
For even if someone makes a portrait of a friend, he does not believe the friend himself to be in it, nor that the limbs of his body are confined within the parts of the painting, but that the respect for the friend is shown through the portrait. Again, we see this referential uh, philosophy here at, at work. So that it's not just a dumb, uh, the early Christians weren't arguing against just like a, a, a a dumb veneration of images. They weren't thinking that that the pagans were just simplistically uh, believing that these things actually were gods or actually, you know, were whatever was being represented there. The the, the pagan philosophers had, had quite a bit, as we know, of sophistication, you know, uh, from Socrates, prior to Socrates and, and after Socrates, long before Christ. So we also have uh, Ian Bleakus, who is uh, a, a later uh, Neoplatonic philosopher, he uh, said similarly two issues. Uh, this is uh, Barash's um, summary here, analysis. Two issues in Ian Bleakus's texts are of significance. Uh, first is his attitude to the argument. This is page 82. First is his argument uh, attitude to the argument so often discussed that the images of the gods are material objects. Now, in the early 4th century AD, especially in Iamblichus's world, the attitude to matter was different from what it had been among the educated skeptics of earlier centuries. Far from seeing matter as the embodiment of evil, Iamblichus conceived of it as a creation of the great God. That the images of the gods are material objects does then not detract from their validity and power. So here we see... Uh, um, uh, an argument in favor of the the goodness of creation. Um, later Christians will say that because Christ was incarnate, he purified matter, therefore we can depict him in matter. Um, so here we see a, a clear antecedent in the ancient Neoplatonic argumentation. Um, skipping over here to page 83, um, Statements such as this show how deeply uh, ambiguity had permeated Iamblichus's thought, yet his ambiguity should not be understood as literary metaphors only. Within his ambiguous thinking, there always remains the belief in a real link between the image and the God, which is a, a, a fascinating question uh, to raise in regards to the later uh, orthodox iconodulia uh, theory is this linkage when we say that, that it's semiotic. Well, how does it pass? What's the means? What's the method by which it pa uh, passes from the object uh, to to God himself or to, to one of the saints? Of course, that leaves wide open the question of, of why vain saints are being venerated um, in that same way, but we won't uh, go into that too deeply here. Um, here's later, we're looking at, uh, this I, I believe is uh, discussing Proclus, uh, to double check there, um, but could an 8th century Christian teacher, educated in Hellenistic traditions and familiar with Proclus's thought, yes, Proclus, uh, employ this notion of likeness in order to defend the image of Christ painted on a piece of board and exhibit, exhibited in the church? One doubts it. So could an 8th century Christian teacher educated in Hellenistic traditions and familiar with Proclus's thought employ this notion of likeness in order to defend the image of Christ painted on a piece of board and exhibited in the church? One doubts it. In a sense, the internal development of the concept of resemblance came to an end with Proclus. There is no denying that the iconoclastic debate, especially, especially the arguments put forward by the defenders of icons, would be unthinkable without Proclus's heritage and what he represents. There is no dot denying that the iconoclastic debate, especially the arguments put forward by the defenders of icons, would be unthinkable without Proclus's heritage and what he represents. So showing this, this kind of dependence upon the Neoplatonic philosophical exposition of uh, se semiotic imagery. Moving forward again to the early Christian apologists. Uh, he observes <clears throat> that uh, the first encounter between Christian thinkers was a rejection of images of God on page 96. We have actually at least five that he lists here. 
We have uh, Arist uh, Aristides uh, of Athens, the first Christian apologist whose work has come down to us, who wrote uh, around A.D. 140. He also lists Justin Martyr. He also lists Tatian. He also lists in the from the epistle to Diognetius and also Athenagoras of Athens. So he lists all of these uh, various well-known, or I guess among uh, those who research these things, uh, well-known early Christian apologists that they were really unified. He said what these early Christian apologists have to say about the images of the gods is so similar. It's actually unified. It's a unified uh, rejection, or we could say aniconism. If, if someone tries to mistake this argument for iconoclasm, they're going to get some false positives for iconodulia. And that's a clear thing to, to uh, be aware of. Some of these authors may have been, in fact, iconoclastic, but we're not making an argument for iconoclasm. We're making an argument for aniconism. So he says, not a single one of these Christian documents composed between A.D. 140 and 180 suggests a deviance from the basic attitude of rejection. He says the rejection of divine images is complete. So there's not a distinction being made. Oh, well, we know how these pagans have their false semiosis, uh, their, fa their false iconology. We have our true iconology. We don't find that in any of these, these authors. We also have where he writes, Baruch writes on page 100, yet in reading the texts of the apologists, we do not find a single statement that, however interpreted, would oblige us to qualify the conclusion that the Christians of the time rejected sacred images. So there's no need, there's nothing that would in, inspire us or move us to qualify that claim, that observation. It was just, it was what was believed by all everywhere in all places at all times uh, in that in those centuries um, that, that earliest period of Christian writing and so there there's really no no question of what the early consensus was it was a rejection of the religious use of imagery moving forward <clears throat> We have uh, on page 111, he writes, some modern students have proposed a distinction between Tertullian. We've moved forward to Tertullian now. Third century, uh, his rejection of idols, which is total and unconditional, and his attitude to any other images the artist may make. To my mind, uh, that is Baruch, this distinction is hard to maintain. While it is true that Tertullian expressly condemns only idols, he never mentions any other classes of images that images other than idols are not explicitly condemned should probably not be understood as a tacit acknowledgement of their legitimacy. So here we could say that Tertullian might move all the way into iconoclasm, but we're not arguing for iconoclasm here. We're pointing out that Tertullian represents a, a witness towards a non-use of religious imagery. He's not standing as an outlier uh, in that sense. He might be an outlier in a, in a, in a more extreme uh, rejection of imagery, uh, but he's certainly not um, uh, something else. <clears throat> he's certainly, cer certainly not odd in not representing a, a support of icons or imagery. So even if he is odd in a total rejection. Looking here on page uh, 112, in the Christian world of the third century, that is shortly after Tertullian's time, suspicion and disdain of the artist were common. Quote, no oblations may be received from those who paint with colors, from those who make idols or workers in gold, silver, and bronze, says a third century Syriac didascalia. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a, a document that gives rules for church order, polity, how things are to be ordered and organized and uh, in the church, church discipline. We'll look at that. We'll read that again. It says, no oblations, no worship may be received, uh, or I mean, no offerings may be received from those who paint with colors, from those who make idols or workers in gold, silver, and bronze. They're not even allowed to bring offerings to the church. This is just a rule. This, And because it's the Syriac Didascali, it's not just one author. This is an entire regional rule. Um, in uh, from Syria. And so 
they certainly aren't allowing icon icons and images in their worship if they're not allowing or in their worship spaces even probably if they're not even allowing those who paint to to uh, provide any uh, offerings to the church and in a pseudo clementine church order whether that's pseudo or not uh, we won't uh, debate here uh, and in a pseudo clementine church order he writes a painter is put in the same list with a harlot, a brothel keeper, a drunkard, an actor, and an athlete. We have some priests who are actors. That they're kind of violating some early church um, uh, rules here and understandings. Uh, so in a pseudo-Clementine letter, uh, church order, a painter is put on the same list with a harlot, a brothel keeper, a drunkard, an actor, and an athlete. If they had been accepting icons uh, or icon painting, uh, as a legitimate form of Christian practice, they then uh, we, we see it, that they're not accepting uh, icon painters as a legitimate form of, of Christian lifestyle uh, is very clear that they're they're put on list with 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 great sinners and those who would be excluded, who would be uh, under church censure and discipline. So the attitude expressed in such orders must have been widespread. I, I think Baruch is correct here. They hardly derive from Tertullian, but it was he who gave to the common beliefs and opinions a theoretical formulation and foundation. So he exercises the art of painting, a thing forbidden. That's Hermogenes, we know as a heretic. In addition to holding and propagating false views, he exercises the art of painting, a thing forbidden. So it was well known that painting is itself is forbidden. So if painting is forbidden, icons are forbidden, a fortiori. Um, continuing forward, I don't want to spend too, I know I'm spending a, a bit of time here, but thank you for your patience. So what a statue may be in itself beyond its meaning to the audience does not matter at all. Uh, to, uh, yet the ability to affect the spectator, Tertullian seems to believe in an essential characteristic of the statue and of every work of art as, stu as such. The reason is that the statue's impact on society is bound to be fatal. By its very nature, it is capable of being used in idolatrous worship, and given the fallacies of human nature, it will eventually promote actual idolatry, which can be observed in many uh, Orthodox churches, sadly, regrettably. Uh, in a somewhat dubious use of etymology, he explains, uh, Idos in Greek signifies form, uh, Idolon derived diminutively, from that by an equivalent process in our language makes formling every form and formling therefore claims to be called an idol hence idolatry is all attendance and service about every idol okay so attendance and service bowing in front of them kissing them any kind of uh, use of them in seeking to render worship either to them directly or to god through them uh we won't even talk about an angel or a saint um which is even uh, I would say, more egregious. <clears throat> we have an inborn inclination to sin, as we know the, the heart is an idle factory. Uh, for this reason, he thinks the biblical prohibition of images is formulated as, pro, is formulated as a prohib, prohibition to make images, just even making them. Just the, the, the physical act of making them is, is prohibited, much less having them. You can't have them if you can't make them. And if you make them, then you are already violating the second commandment. Moving forward, uh, Tertullian would have considered images an index of paganism. It's actually a, a, a sign of, of the presence of paganism and heresy. Let's see, moving forward, we see on page 143, in addition to this comprehensive and symbolic use of the term, however, we've moved forward to the era of Eusebius, 4th century. Uh, in addition to this comprehensive and symbolic use of the term, however, Eusebius also speaks of images of Christ in a narrow and specific sense, that is, as painted icons, material pictures actually made by an artist. His texts provide some early, perhaps the very first mentions of specific artistic motifs that served to depict Christ, such as the Good Shepherd. But what's interesting is we have an incredibly specific and direct and clear instruction from uh, Eusebius uh, in response to a request by the Empress. So from a famous letter to Constantia Augusta, 
Some parts of it were quoted and discussed uh, at the famous Council of Nicaea uh, in a polemical treatise by St. Nicephorus devoted to an orthodox refutation of Eusebius's views, etc. Constantia asked the bishop of Caesarea to send her an image of Christ. They wished to have the image of a god, a hero, or a saint, and possibly worship it. Uh, was, of course, common usage in antiquity. The bishop, however, that is Eusebius, bluntly rejected the noble lady's request. What did he say? You also wrote me, uh, Eusebius uh, said, to me concerning some supposed image of Christ, which image you wished me to send you. Now, what kind of thing is this that you call the image of Christ? I do not know what impelled you to request that an image of our Savior should be delineated. What sort of image are you seeking? Who then would be able to represent by means of dead colors and inanim inanimate delineations the glistening, flashing radiance of such dignity and glory when even his superhuman disciples could not bear to behold him on the transfiguration in this guise and fell on their faces, thus admitting that they could not withstand the sight? How can one paint an image of so wondrous and unattainable a form unless, like the unbelieving pagans, one is to represent things that bear no possible resemblance to anything? Such practices are not lawful to us. So that creates a very strong consensus from the second century, we can include the first century, of course, all the way to Eusebius, uh, in the 4th century, uh, showing that the later promotion of icons is uh, very clearly um, an innovation in violating the, the rule of St. Vincent, Vincent that what has been re uh, re believed everywhere, always and by all, is what is orthodox. He, he violates the uh, iconodulia, the Seventh Ecumenical Council violates that. And so in reading uh, the Christian literature from Athenagoras to Eusebius, one cannot question that the image was felt as a permanent challenge. It was not accepted. It was resisted. It was, it was uh, a, a, always a theme of, of dispute. It was characteristic of pagans to argue for them, characteristic of Christians to argue against them, never to qualify it, which you would expect, which you, would, would be a necessary evidence uh, for an Orthodox Christian saying that in the first few centuries of the church, there was the use of icons. You'd have to find, um, you know, these kinds of qualifications that would say, yes, these icons uh, were here and they're dif being differentiated from the pagan use or the pagan argumentation, but it never happens. Um, here's another work um, on the Patriarch Nicephorus of Constantinople uh, by Paul Alexander. This is published by uh, Oxford Uni University Press. We'll just go through a few of these. Um, he also, uh, we'll just look at the introduction where he sets the historical uh, context and look at some of his conclusions as well. He says, in spite of the difficulties of the text, it seems clear that in the clause set in italics, Aristides, that early um, apologist that we mentioned earlier, is alluding to a philosophical theory according to which the cult of statues are not the gods, but their images. So again, we have this, this, this clear statement that in the early pagan notion of iconology or of image usage, that it's rep representative. It's a representative use of images. So this isn't just a simplistic, mindless uh, use of imagery. It's a sophisticated philosophical use of imagery like the Seventh Ecumenical Council is ar uh, arguing. Uh, Justin Martyr repeats Aristides' arguments against the soulless and dead idols, which according to him have not the shape of God, but the form of evil demons. He hints vaguely at a counterclaim of his opponents that the shape of cult statues is an imitation in honor of the gods. Moving forward, uh, more of the, on the symbolic theory uh, that it was also known by Athenagoras. He wrote, uh, but since it is affirmed by some that although these are only likenesses, again, that likenesses is the sim, sim, symbolist argu, uh, argument, yet there exist gods in honor of whom they are made, and that the supplications and sacrifices presented to the likeness are to be referred to the gods, or that referential argumentation again. So if there's a referential argument, 
here in this early century, in this uh, in in the very era of Athenagoras, we're going to have to ad admit that it was well known and debated uh, uh, by Christians. Uh, the uh, early Christians argued against it, so that Saint people like Saint John of Damascus and some or a couple earlier figures started picking up that pagan argument. Is a clear uh, um, rem uh, self removal from the early consensus of the church. Um, it seems to become clear that it was just the, the pagan spirit in fallen man, the, the, the idolatrous spirit in fallen man is, is so powerful that the, when the church became uh, legally Christian, um, exclusively Christian in, uh, in terms of legality in the later fourth century under Theodosius the Great, that it was just irrepressible. And the urge to to be to, uh, to to worship images was just irrepressible, so they couldn't do anything really to resist it. So you have this slow creep of of the use of images in worship, um, uh, veneration, or w what have you. I think the distinction is is really a bit specious in this situation. Um, we also have um, thus uh, for Ath for Athenagoras, the images are matter not God, formed by human hands. To this, the pagans reply um, that the agalmata, agalmata are mere images, i.e. of the gods, and that worship offered to them is referred to the gods themselves. Thus, at least as early as the second century AD, enlightened paganism considers the cult statues as mere icones of the gods, not as the gods themselves. It is this symbolic and anagogical interpretation of religious art, which was to serve later as a defense for Christian images. Celsus wrote uh, in the late second century, uh, very similarly on this uh, particularly pagan view. We'll just do a quick look over here uh, at Origen's response to Celsus, his third century response. Now, this is from uh, Basil the Great and Gregory of Nazianzus's collation from Origen's works. So we can consider this an actual representation of orthodox beliefs about icons um, from, uh, from the great Cappadocian fathers themselves. So we can say that this is, uh, represents accurately uh, a view agreeable to the Cappadocian fathers. So we could say this might even be the Cappadocian view. Um, maybe there are other statements that they make elsewhere that, that may back off from this a little bit. Uh, but here we see something that they published promo and promoted. So uh, on page 83 of this particular edition, it's chapter 29, paragraph 3. Now see whether the principles of our faith, being accordant with man's original conceptions, do not work a change in fair-minded hearers of the word. For though the perverted doctrine, backed up with much instruction, has been able to implant in the minds of the many the belief that images are God's, and that things made of gold and silver and ivory and stone are worthy of worship, common sense, nevertheless, forbids us to think that God is by any means corruptible matter, or that he is honored when he is fashioned by men in forms of dead matter, or that he is honored when he is fashioned by men in forms of dead matter, supposed to pictorially or symbolically represent him. And we accordingly at once decide respecting images that they are not gods and respecting such works of art that they are not to be compared to the creator and that they are insignificant when we think of God who is over all, etc. And so there's really no way to uh, square that circle because because there is there there isn't this this openness there isn't this nuance that oh there's the representational theory that we have uh, where it's where it passes from one to the next it's it's just no it's just no it it, it doesn't work and it doesn't honor God even uh, as a symbol and so what else we have here is Celsus held the same view of the cult statues as divine likenesses uh, the the or Iconis, uh, with his contemporary Athenagoras, combated so energetically. It should be borne in mind that the arguments for and against the images were formulated before Neoplatonism appeared on the scene. So it wasn't just a, a Neoplatonic philosophical development. It was something that was present uh, in uh, literature and in uh, more widespread in various schools of thought. 
Porphyry, in fact, wrote his argument uh, in favor of images, um, at least historically, it's, it's attested that he wrote that prior to even becoming a student of Plotinus. And so uh, later we see here, kind of a fascinating bit here, where Porphyry um, continued, but even if one of the Hellenes would be so light-minded as to think that the gods dwell inside the statutes, uh, statues, his understanding would be much purer than that of a person believing that the divine entered the womb of the Virgin Mary. So, no comment. But uh, we'll move forward here uh, from, from uh, Porphyry to Ju uh, Julian the Apostate, which is just kind of fascinating. Uh, the extant fragments of Julian's Contra Christianos preserve no trace of an apology for image worship, but in a famous letter addressed to the archpriest Theodorus and written shortly before the publication of the Contra Christianos, the emperor, Julian the Apostate, expounded his theory of religious images, which is the same as that John of Damascus gives later. John of Damascus lifts essentially the very thought patterns of Julian the Apostate and says these are Christian thought patterns as symbols of the presence of the gods. Not that we should regard such things as gods, but that we may worship the gods through them. These things are mediatory uh, for worship. So instead of Christ alone being the mediator, now we have icons being mediators of the mediator. It's forbidden. We're called to have a direct uh, relationship with God in Christ. A third class of images was invented on the earth. And by performing our worship to them, we shall make the gods propitious to ourselves. This is Julian. Still, those who make offerings to the images of the gods, though the gods need nothing, do nevertheless thereby persuade them to help and to care for them. And this is so often used of images of, of saints. Um, you know, you oh, pray to this saint if you have this problem. Um, I don't even want to mention the name of a saint because, you know, they would. I'm sure they're mortified to think of that. Therefore, when we look at the images of the gods, let us not indeed think they are stones or wood, but neither let us think they are the gods themselves, but that they are the images of etc. So here we have, once again, the symbolical view of religious art, but in a more complicated form than hitherto noticed. So Julian and Porphyry, they developed the most sophisticated form of argumentation that's later picked up by, by John of Damascus and or some earlier uh, theologians. In Porphyry's work, the symbolic theory of religious images had reached its climax. Um, but here we see later um, that it is about a century prior to John of Damascus. He traces, this author here traces in the writings of uh, Johannes of Thessalonica and Leonid, uh, Leontius of Neapolis can be found the earliest traces of this symbolic argument in defense of Christian uh, image worship, roughly a century before John of Damascus. Uh, there remains, as in so many other cases, the critical gap between late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, between the writings of Porphyry and those of Johannes uh, or Johannes of Thessalonica. This cannot be bridged except by hypothesis. At some time between the 3rd and the 7th century, Christians took over the pagan argumentation, arguments which theretofore had been used by pagan writers in defense of pagan cult statues. Uh, were in the 7th century cited in writings directed against the Jews and pagans. Because you notice they're not picking up any arguments from Athenagoras or Irenaeus. Um, there's the abuse of, of uh, Basil's argument about, re about worship of, uh, to Christ passing to the Father, being some sort of icon of iconology or something, some sort of ar uh, logic useful for iconology. Um, but that's a total eisegesis and abuse of Basil's uh, argument. Some will also use the, the Old Testament argument about uh, looking to the bronze image or the bronze serpent as uh, a justification for icons. But as we know, the bronze image was a type of Christ, uh, not a type of icons. What, what an uh, abusive eisegesis to try to use the bronze uh, serpent as a justification for the use of religious imagery in, in, in processes of worship. So that covers fairly well through there. Um, it is therefore after the year 529 and prior to the work of Giannis Thessalonica that the change took place. He's just trying to theorize when that happened, but it was clearly after the Byzantization of the church. The church was Byzantized. It entered into a Byzantine captivity, a Byzantine metamorphosis, 
Uh, much that was good was retained. We, you know, we have, uh, you know, the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. We have wonderful uh, examples of of orthodoxy still existing in the Byzantine Church and coming out of the Byzantine Church. But there was a metamorphosis. There was a departure from the consensus of the fathers. So they can't. They can no longer claim that. So from the synagogue, uh, the early church did its hostility to religious art which both identified, which both identified with paganism. The Christian apologists of the second and third centuries of the Christian era attacked the cult statues of the pagans roughly on the same grounds as the great Hebrew prophets had done a millennium earlier. The statues consisted of matter and are made and unmade by human hands. It's the fact that it's a representation is what makes it a problem. It's the fact that it has ears and cannot hear. It's the fact that it has eyes and cannot see. That's the problem. It starts to habituate man to superficiality. And this is the big problem with it. God does not want man to become enslaved to matter by worshiping it or venerating it. He wants to have an intimate, personal, direct relationship, which is the whole purpose of the incarnation of Emmanuel, God with us. We have direct access to God. We don't need it mediated through physical matter. Uh, we don't need it me mediated uh, through through saints. Um I have a video coming up, God willing, uh, that will show some of the uh, sort of egregious um, uses of prayer to saints. Um, anyway, uh, for that time, we'll, we'll discuss. So to thoughtful pagans of all periods, and especially to those of the late Roman Empire, the cult statues were not gods, nor were the gods thought to inhabit them. They were merely set up to honor the gods, to remind mortal man of their existence and power, and to ensure that sacrifices and prayers presented at the statues were would reach the gods themselves. This symbolical view of religious statues grew more complex as time went along until authors like Porphyry and Julian, as we saw, systemi systematized the idea of divine representation. So it's very clear that the Christians knew of this more sophisticated theory and rejected it. So and this is what makes it a, a, a profound innovation, and that's uh, that first... Uh, 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 part of our argument um, to show that it violates the Seventh Ecumenical Council, violates uh, the uh, the consensus of the early church. Um, another, just briefly, we already mentioned, uh, we already hinted at this, uh, the argument of the scriptures of God's word against icons, against images, where it says our God is in heaven, Christ is in heaven, Christ God is in heaven, we can say from Psalm um 115 starting at verse 3 he does whatever he pleases their their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands here's the criteria it's not just that they're made they have mouths but they do not speak eyes they have but they do not see they have ears but they do not hear noses they have but they do not smell they have hands but they do not handle feet they have but they do not walk nor do they mutter through their throat those who make them are like them so is everyone who trusts in them. So it's the making and orienting oneself religiously through these things it's, that it's, it's a problem. It distorts the ordering of the soul and its relationship to God. So the last portion of our argument is, in my opinion, perhaps the, the most serious because it's not merely an error that the Seventh Ecumenical Council makes. It's actually a confusion of the gospel. It's a distorted gospel. And we know what Paul says to the Galatians about if someone preaches another gospel. Um, so those who like to curse, the curse goes back on them. So, so God protect us all. But here we see that in, uh, the divine sacra, we're looking here at our seventh ecumenical or seven ecumenical councils book here, <clears throat> uh, all the way on page 529. We'll begin from the divine sacra sent by the emperors, Constantine and Irene to the most holy and most blessed Hadrian Pope of old Rome where they claim, but come up hither to aid us in the confirmation and establishment of the ancient tradition of venerable images. So by then they had a couple, maybe a couple hundred years of veneration of images. And as we know, in most of our parishes, um, some done something done for 10, 20 years becomes ancient tradition to people. So, you know, it, it's, it's a false claim that it is an ancient tradition, at least in terms of going back to the first several centuries, the Antonicene church. Uh, moving forward here, we see this question of anathema being given 
So uh, this is the Imperial Sacra read at the first session. Constantine and Irene, sovereigns of the Romans uh, in the faith, etc. The episcopate of this royal and heaven-defended city, I should have to carry with me the anathema of the whole Catholic Church, which consigns me to that outer darkness, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. So here we see the, the what anathema means to them. Some people say, oh, well, anathema doesn't mean that they're cut off from heaven or they're cut off from salvation. No, that's exactly what anathema means in their understanding at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Uh, it means that which consigns someone to that outer darkness, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, here we'll see again. Uh, as Peter, the chief of the apostolic college, struck the mad slave and cut off his uh, his Jewish ear with the sword, so in like manner do ye wield the axe of the spirit and every tree which bears the fruit of contention of strife, of newly imported innovation, either renew by transplanting through the words of sound doctrine or lay it low with canonical censure, that's that anathema, and send it to the fires of the future Gehenna. So this is... This question of the Seventh Ecumenical Council and the use of images is at the level of Gehenna, of permanent, utter, total destruction in hell. That's a very serious claim. <clears throat> Let's see. Moving forward here. We'll see the semiotic argument again. The figures and effigies of the divine and all lauded apostles, also of the God-speaking prophets, and of the struggling martyrs and of the holy men, so that through their representations we may be able to be led back in memory and recollection to the prototype. Remember what we pointed out earlier from the pagan arguments of recollection and memory, and reference to the, to the prototype, and have a share in the holiness of some of them, so you receive holiness through the mediation of these objects. Here's another question about the nature of curse, the God-forsaken heretics who had brought charges against the holy and spotless church of the Christians for the setting up of holy images, the God-hated heretics. So if you don't love images and you're anathematized, you're considered God-hated by those who consider themselves to be the only possible church. So getting into this a little bit further, we have again... Uh, for by so much more frequently as they are seen in artistic representation, by so much more readily are men lifted up to the memory of their prototypes and to a longing after them. And to these should be given due salutation and honorable reverence. Not indeed that true worship of faith, which pertains alone to the divine nature. Here's the specious distinction, but to these, uh, as to the figure of the precious and life-giving cross, and to the book of the Gospels, and to the other holy objects, incense and lights may be offered. So here, uh, again, this, this, this question of, of some of these teaching items, uh, icons being kind of associated. For the honor which is paid to the image passes on to that which the image represents, and he re who reveres the image reveres, it, reveres in it the subject represented. How that so is um, a mystery. For thus the teaching of our holy fathers, that is the tradition of the Holy Catholic Church, which is, uh, again, we've shown that it's false. So we anathematize the introduced novelty of the revilers of the Christians. We salute the venerable images. We place under anathema those who do not do this. So those who do not venerate them. Anathema to those who do not salute the holy and venerable images. Anathema, hellfire, essentially, we just read, Gehenna. Anathema to those who call the sacred images idols. Anathema to those who say that Christians resort to the sacred images as to gods. They're using the exact same argument. They literally have picked up the same argument from at least Porphyry uh, and Celsus earlier and Julian the very apostate. They've picked up the very thing and now here they're trying to say that they're not. Uh, doing such a thing. Anathema to those who say that any other delivered us from idols except Christ our God. Uh, anathema to those who dare to say that uh, at any time the Catholic Church received idols. History is, is just, it bears clear witness. Moving forward. But notice, notice the problem is not merely historical. They've said that now salvation is dependent on bowing in front of images. That Christ came and delivered us from sin, death, and hell 
in order for us to bow down in front of matter now. And if you don't, you don't have Christ. If you don't venerate matter, you you are not a Christian. Uh, moving forward. Let's see. Excommunicated. Oh, that's a that's just uh, Canon 13 is about uh, turning monasteries into public houses. But they said excommunicated as those who have been condemned from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and assigned their place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That just gives another idea. When they excommunicated someone for some of these things, that's what it meant. It meant cut off from God completely. So if you don't venerate icons, according to Orthodox, the Seventh the Orth Eastern Orthodox Church, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and those who adopt it and affirm it, uh, then you're going to hell. You're utterly cut off from God. So it is, its character is evinced. This is clearly but a salutation and is so called, and its character is evinced by our touching the things mentioned with our lips. So in other words, kissing of the with the lips is required. We grant that the word uh, prosky, pros, proskinesis is frequently found in the divine scriptures and in the writings of our learned and holy fathers for the worship and spirit. Uh, since being a word of many significations, so they're trying to speciously twist scripture to say that proskinesis can mean uh, kissing physical images. Like the second commandment forbids uh, the divine scripture. Let's see. Venerating saints, of course. Oh, you must kiss them. We have likewise decreed that these images are to be rever reverenced. That is, salutations are to be offered to them. They are. If you refuse it, you refuse, you you throw yourself into hell. The reason for using the word is that it has a twofold signification. For the word in the old Greek tongue signifies both to salute and to kiss. And the preposition pros gives it uh, gives to it the additional idea of strong desire towards the object. If you don't have strong desire towards the image, you're 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 sunk you're sunk you're spiritually sunk you have to have a strong affection according to the seventh ecumenical council's own decrees and canons and rules and censures uh it's an anathemas you are anathema if you don't have strong desire towards the physical object if you love the gospel you have to know that this is a clear violation of it this is exactly the kind of thing that paul is saying is if anyone comes and and, and, and is now going to try to boast in your flesh you know, through, through getting you to to, circ to be circumcised or to bow down in front of images. Like, what are you going to begin in the spirit and be perfected by the flesh? It, it, uh, it's, it's, it's the wild, wild west here in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So which last word implies salutation and strong love for that which one loves? He also reverences and what he reverences that he greatly loves as the everyday custom, etc. So you must love the icon. And by loving the icon, that's how you love that which is represented in it. Um, let's see. Now it defines the curse here again. It says, such an one, our holy ecumenical council. So again, this is the infallible seventh ecumenical council, untouchable. If anyone does not so believe, but undertakes to debate the matter, just to debate the matter. If you debate icons, even to debate, debate the matter further, and is evil affected with regard to the veneration due, due the sacred images, such and one, our holy ecumenical council, fortified by the inward working of the Spirit of God. I don't know if that's a blasphemy of the Spirit of God to claim that everyone will be damned according to non-veneration of images. Uh, and by the traditions of the fathers, we've already shown that it's not the traditions of the early fathers for centuries, and of the church, anathematizes. Now, anathema is nothing less than complete separation from God. They're defining it. Don't let your friendly neighborhood priest say, oh, no, I wouldn't kick you out of the church. You're already kicked out of the church if you don't have strong love, desire, and affection for icons. If you're not in the Orthodox Church, according to, to Decithius, you're not even a Christian, much less in a church. Um, and that's from, an ecum that's from a, a local council, but it was about as ecumenical as it could be at the time in the 17th century. So you're anathema if you don't venerate images. 
which is a clear, clear, clear violation of the gospel. Now, we know that we are saved by Christ's blood alone, not through paint on a, on a board, but through Christ alone. The gospel is free for you to accept by faith alone, through grace alone. And if you have saving faith, you will be, your faith will work through love. And so please, uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, if you have any, any love of the gospel, please avoid the spiritual materialism. Please be very, very careful of, of the kinds of arguments that, that the Orthodox Church will, will love to give. They're just going to try to get you into the end zone. They're going to try to move you there. Maybe you have a strong resistance, but you're at the 10 yard line because you're at the 10 yard line. Well, they want to get you to the, on the other side of the 100 yard line. They're going to try to move you there. So brothers and sisters, please be careful of the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's a corruption, a clear corruption of the gospel by making salvation literally fa factually dependent on kissing painted images. So we give glory to, to God alone and Christ alone through the Holy Spirit alone. Glory to God.